we crown you Lord of all. Thank you for your presence in our midst this day. Thank you for your power that is at work in us. All glory, all honor, all adoration to you, Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we have come that you might instruct us from your word, that you might bless us from your word, that you might liberate us with your word. Lord, we pray that every one of us here this morning, whether it be through the media, the various platforms, or whether we're physically present, both the era and the speaker, Jehovah God of heaven, breathe upon us in the mighty name of Jesus. Let your power transform our lives in the mighty name of Jesus. Let your power prepare us for that inheritance that is in Christ Jesus in the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you, King of glory. We bless your name, Lord. For in Jesus' name, we have prayed. Because you have pleased the heart of the Father, Turn with me to Acts 9, 31. You are going to pray for yourself. Acts 9, verse 31. It says, Then as the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria and were edified and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost, were what? Were multiplied. He said they had rest throughout. I pray for you. Because you have pleased the heart of the Father, you will have rest throughout. In the mighty name of Jesus. Whatever troubled you to church this morning, I say by reason of this word, you have rest throughout in the name of Jesus. Thank you, mighty God. Give you all the praise and all the glory. For in Jesus' name, we have prayed. Please be seated. Again, you are welcome to church this morning. Those of us online and those physically present. Thank God for the power in his word. Today, we're looking at transformative power of our inheritance. Still continuing with our theme, our inheritance in Christ Jesus. If there's anything that helps us to access that inheritance that we have in Christ Jesus, it is the transformative power. Because for you to access that inheritance, the work of transformation must take place. You must be transformed. And unfortunately, because we're bogged down with the troubles all around us, many of us are beginning to look focus on the fact that God has committed enormous responsibility unto us. And that's why Romans 3, 1 to 2, talks about the fact that something has been delivered unto us. Look at it with me. He said, we have an advantage. He said, what advantage then had the Jew? Or what profit is there of circumcision? He said, much every way, chiefly, because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. The revelations of God has been committed into our hands. We have it. Whether you now operate in it or not is a different thing entirely. But as far as God is concerned, he has handed over to us the oracles of God. We know him. We can understand him. We can assess him. Men of the world, when you say somebody has the oracle, it doesn't behave just anyhow. Even among those if you find him among people of his class, or even when they call them chiefs, you find that the one that bears the oracle stands out. But as children of God, 
for whatever reason, God handed this oracle over to us. And yet, we are living our lives as though nothing has happened. I pray that the word of God today will transform us indeed in the mighty name of Jesus. Our perspective will change. The whole essence of God revealing to us at this time or charging us or bringing us to a point of helping us to appreciate that this world is temporary as it were. No matter what you find of this world, as is recorded in 2 Corinthians 4.18, whatever you see of this world, it says, why we look not at the things which are seen, but are the things which are not seen. He said, for the things which are seen, they are what? They are temporal. In other words, they will go away. That why it's temporal cannot become permanent. Say they are temporal. But the things which are not seen are eternal. And that's the one we should go after. That's the one we should live our lives for. That's the one we should always bear in mind that there is a destination where that is kept for us. We have an inheritance in Christ and the transformative power of God will bring us to that inheritance. You know, when we came to Christ, some of the songs we used to sing got better understanding as we continue to grow in Christ. And I managed to sing two of them. And I, I, and I, I mean, you know I sing very well. He said, I've got my mind made up and I won't oh, turn back. Because I want to see my Jesus someday. someday. I've, I've got, got my, my mind made up, made up and I won't turn back. Because I want to see my, my Jesus someday. Someday. Goodbye. Why did you that song? Oh, wait, okay, maybe we'll take it to then. Goodbye, whatever you no longer with you. Goodbye, I pleasure. Oh, see. I stay no longer with you. Why? I made up my mind to go for the rest of my life. Go 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 rest of my life. I made up my mind to go. can boldly still sing that song today. Said, I've made up my mind. You know, in those days, when you come to salvation, when you become convicted, in fact, some people, you will see them wailing from their seats, coming forward once the, 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 the altar call is made. Why? Because the gravity, the way the power comes to transform can you imagine the other life, what it would have been if Christ had not come to save you? Can you imagine what life will look like if Christ is absent in his sin of today? Said, I've made up my mind. Goodbye sin, whatever it is that makes for sin. Goodbye. Why? Because the transformative power of God has worked upon me. That's what that song is saying. We sing it with all boldness. We sing it with all sincerity of art. And that's what will keep us. And that's what keep. I mean, it will keep you till eternity. Because your focus is not on the things which you see. It is on the things which you do not see. Is that because those ones are eternal. So the propelling force is that as you think of that which is eternal, no matter what it is that you see of this present world, cannot be compared to it. It cannot. But because of the challenges we have around us, even though the scriptures recorded and warned us 
that that time will come, and we're in that time now, yet we still don't understand that our focus should be the destination. And we go around, we behave the way they behave, we do things the way they do things, forgetting that as far as they are concerned, they have, their destination is here. But we have a destination that we're working for. And God will take us. There is, it's not even prayer. It is that that destination is sure that God has preserved for us. He obtained it by giving his only begotten son. So he can't compromise it. It's there. It is to, for us to walk into it. You know, if someone says, I have decided now this, we know to follow Jesus. As simple as that. Those days, when you say, I have decided to follow, you don't sing it when you are not ready. You sing it only when you are ready. When the transformative power has worked upon you, when you are singing that song, you are singing it with meaning. I have decided. He said, if no one joins me, eh, I will follow. I will go. Why? Because you have a destination. But is it the same story today? Even those who sing, when, when you make altar call, people laugh, people look at, it's no longer the way it used to be. What has changed? That power must come back to work in our lives and transform us and bring us. It is only when that power works in our lives that our inheritance is guaranteed. Only those who are transformed are sure to get that inheritance. Do you know that even Jesus, even Jesus had to be transfigured. When you have, when that transformation power works in your life, the first thing that happens is that every form of anxiety will decrease and peace of mind will increase. That's how you know. When people are giving their testimonies in those days, they will say, I just felt peace. After that word, I surrendered my life to Jesus. When the transformative power works upon your life, anxiety disappears. It decreases. Yes, it shows up some time, but the fact is that it decreases. It cannot be on the increase. And then the peace of God increases. When that transformation power works on you, stress will decrease. Stability will increase. Why? You know, um, Yorubas have a saying. I, um, it says, if you're, the Yorubas say that if something is, if you are sure of something, then you are, help me now. If, yes, if you are sure of your destination, then you should be proud of it. You should go around and let people know that even though you are in this world, you are not of this world. You have a destination. When you comprehend the transformative power of God, frustrations in life will decrease and satisfaction in life will increase. No matter what comes around to frustrate you, it can only be on the decrease. Why? Because you have Christ. When you have Christ, you have everything. When you have Christ, you have everything. You know, these days, I, I wonder, some, those young ones will tell you that because of the new profession they have picked, whatever profession it is, they will tell you, um, this, this is how we are supposed to look now. 
because we now do this or we are now this or whatever. They become immediately transformed. And I'm asking myself, <laughs> so easy. They just, they just tell you, my office demands of me this. And just key in, no matter what it is. <laughs> but when it comes to the transformative power in Christ, we contest. And that's why Colossians 3 that we read began to teach us why we should not be like those who do not have an understanding of what is going to happen at the end of the day. Verse 1 began to teach us that one of the things you must quickly remember always and at all times is your identity. Who do you belong to? Of whom are you? No matter what the environment is requesting of you, wherever you find yourself, you should be bold enough to say, I would rather stand for Christ. The scripture says, a good name is what? It's better than silver and gold. Our parents will always tell us, remember what? The son or the daughter of who you are. What are they trying to say to you? Remember your identity. Don't eat with the pigs. Don't dwell among those who do not have hope. For the sake of the temporal things that we see. That's what he said. Remember what? Your identity. When you see the child of a prominent man in this country, do you need anybody to describe to you? In fact, some of them is as bad as you don't even need their name by their look alone. One of them in those days, once you see, you say this one belongs to this particular family. Can we be described us? Can people see us and say we carry the identity of Christ? Can men distinguish us? Can they look at us and say truly the transformative power of God have worked on this one? What is your identity? What identity do you carry around? Paul, you know, when we read the letters of Paul, when you go back to Acts 9 and study that encounter, nothing else would have been short of what he's writing. He had that encounter. I will come to it in a bit. He had that encounter. And so there was no compromising, there was no contest about it, there was no discussion about it. He went out and began to say to them, if this thing that I've encountered, if it is the same power that brought me to my knees, to the point of salvation, if it is the same power that you have encountered and have brought about transformation of your life, you will not compromise your identity for whatever reason. Forget about what they say the demand of the work environment is. You will stand for Christ, no matter what. Verse 2 taught us the need to renew our thoughts. It says, set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Why? Because 2 Corinthians 4.18 told us that those things which are here that we see are what? They are temporal. Let your thought life reflect that you have a destination, that you have Christ living in you. Let everything about you reflect it. 
and three to seven of the same scripture. You know, Paul, there was no hiding about the fact that Paul began to teach and also was able to show us and tell us the fact that he said, for ye are dead. Your life, your life, your life is hid with Christ in God. In other words, no matter what is going on around you, always remember that your life is hidden in Christ. And so, let whatever wave goes around you, your life is hid in Christ. You recognize that always. Because when you recognize that, you will know that you have a sure defense in him. And verse 4 says, when Christ who is our life, oh, I love God, said when Christ who is our life shall appear, then shall he also appear with him in glory. Ah, if you are going to appear with God in glory, then you will live your life differently. He says, we appear with him in glory. And that's why your focus should go beyond the now. Walk towards what? Eternity. Recognize that your whole life is dead. Is dead. He said, let go of your past habits. After that, I had told us how to make sure that we have an identity and that we recognize that our whole life, in out of, in, from eight, he began to then teach us of the fact that, look, oh, you must let every old habit go away from you. Verse eight, please. Verse 8, it says, but now, you also put off. Take it off. It is not required for you to access the inheritance that is in Christ Jesus. And he listed them. He's not going to put them off for you. It is required of you to put them off. That's why I said, put off. Take them out. All this anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication. He said, do what? Take them out of your mouth. It is, not the, it is not required for the language of heaven. It is not required for the language of our destination. And that's why he's encouraging us to do what? Take it out. And in taking them out, you must first recognize them for you to do what? To take them out. And he finally then said in 12 to 14, he said, replace them with new habits. He said, put on. That one he said, do what? Put off. But this one he said, do what? Put on. As the children of God, as those who bear the inheritance of Christ, he said, do what? Bowels of what? Mercy. Kindness. Humbleness of mind, meekness, long suffering. If all of us in this all put on this, Nigeria would be a better place. But you know why it's so difficult? Because we lose our identity just at every, every, everything that comes away. The first thing that we compromise is what? Our identity. We throw it away. And once you throw away your identity, then what becomes of you? He said, when the soul loses his power, what, he said, it's not useful for anything. Other than men should do what? Trample upon it. It's not useful for anything again. Many Christians have lost their salary. Our, it has become rotten. The faith that some of us profess no longer reflects the faith that our fathers handed 
over to us. I pray that God will bring us to a point where we will come back. We will trace our steps back as the power works upon our lives. Now let's take a few examples to drive the point home. Let's look at the life of Paul. Saul of Tarsus that then became Paul. We read in Acts 9, 1 to 9, that Paul was going to do what he knows to do best. He was going to persecute the church. He had taken permission. He took men with him that would help him to accomplish that, 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 that tax. But along the way, the same way many of us, or most of us, came to a point where we surrendered. You know, when we talk to people about salvation, when the first thing, if you ask anybody, are you born again? You say, I'm born again. But when you now start asking the question, can you tell us your salvation experience? Ah, do you know what? I was born into a Christian home. We, we, we used to do um, family devotion. My father used to ring the bell in the morning, and all of us would come to. So I am a Christian. That's the story most of them will tell you. Beloved, if you don't have the salvation story to tell, you have not started. It cannot be, it's not magic. It cannot be assumed that you are born again. When you have that experience, it's something you want to hold on to. Which was what propelled Paul to begin to write those letters. And just one of them is what we have considered this morning. When you read all of those other letters, the experience he had, just this one experience, made him to know and to continue to profess to everyone and anyone around him that there is no alternative. No alternative. The Bible says when that light came upon him, when the power of transformation came upon him, he went on his knees and he began to ask, what do you want me to do? It's now beyond my power. The Bible says that the people, if you study that Acts 9, in fact, read it up to 19. At your spare time. When he had that encounter, when you read from, if I give us from 7, quickly, from 7. He said, and the man who journeyed with him stood what? Speechless. They were shocked. Why? Because they know the story of Paul. They know his antecedents. And all of a sudden, this Paul that we are following, that we are going to kill, we are going to destroy, we are going to... They were hearing the voice that was speaking to Paul. But they saw no man. Verse 8. Then and Saul arose from the head. And when his eyes were opened, he saw no man. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. Even men around him. Can men testify of your salvation experience? Can you yourself be able to tell of your salvation story? If not, you have an opportunity today. Today we are reading about Paul because it happened. And today we are reading about the letters because he was able to document the impact of that transformative power upon his life. Let me take one more. Rahab, that we read in Joshua 2, 1 to 21. I will take just four things that happened to that woman. Joshua sent out men 
to spy out the land. And just one person was able to spare the lives of those men that brought about the transformation, that brought about. You know, if that woman had not, of course, we can talk about grace, we can talk about the mercy of God, we can talk about the favor of God. Same with every one of us. Favor is available, grace is available to bring us to the point of salvation. And that's why Ephesians 2, 8 talks about the fact that it's not, it's not our power. It's not the work that we do. It is what? The grace of God. But how much have you tapped into that grace? Rahab was there, had the opportunity to allow that the God of transformation bring hope to our future. One of the things that that power does is that it gives hope. When you give your life to Jesus, one of the things you should bear in mind is that you now have what? Hope of your tomorrow. When that part came upon Rahab, it was time for her future to change. That same woman, who, if we ask us what we can remember of her, many of us we talk about her as the harlot of the city. But beyond being the harlot of the city, that woman. Have a nine age with Christ. When you read um, those scriptures, when you read Matthew 1, from 1 to 5, it will tell you how she became related to Christ. But ordinarily, she would have been described as an alert. The second thing that happened to her is that that transformative power, and I'm challenging us today, for as many as are yet to come to that point, understand this fact, that when that power comes upon you, it has the ability, the capacity, the potential to transform you of tomorrow. It also has the capacity, the potential, the ability to transform your present. No matter what your story is as of today, that power has the ability to transform it. And that's why if you look at verse 12 of that scripture, of Joshua 2, verse 12, it says, Now therefore I pray you, swear unto me by the Lord, since I have showed you kindness, that ye will also show kindness unto my father's house and give me a true token. What was she requesting for? She was requesting that at tomorrow be what? Be preserved. When you come to Christ, part of the package is that your tomorrow is guaranteed. Your today is what? Is work done. And your tomorrow is preserved in hope. The third thing is that when you now read further and you get to Joshua 6, as you study, and you get to Joshua 6 25. Joshua 6 25. That same power brought out this favor. It says, and Joshua. Saved Rahab, the harlot, as if harlot is her surname, and her father's household, and all that she had. And she dwelt in Israel even unto this day. Now, she had no reason whatsoever to come to that lineage of the beloved of the Lord. But that power 
brought transformation onto our life. Even though what men will remember quickly of her is that, oh, that, that alert woman. But today, when the genealogy of Jesus is written, Rahab's name is always what? Mentioned. As you find in Matthew 1. She possessed, she got that favor. When you come to Christ, you become highly favored. Why? The simple, you are separated from and you are brought into. And that's how we talked about the fact that your name is erased from the book of death and it's, your name is now written, it's transferred into what? The book of life. By reason of the transformative power of God. If you allow that power to work on you, it will change. It will transform. It will give you the hope of tomorrow. It will give you a future and a hope. It will give you a tomorrow that is better than whatever it is that you have of today. And finally, the same power transformed our future prophetically. And that's why if you read Matthew 1, that I was saying, verse 5 to 6, 1, 5 to 6, let's just say the 5 to 6. It said, and Salmon begat Booz of Rechab, and that Booz is Boaz, and that Rechab is Rahab, and Boaz begat Obed of Ruth, and Obed begat Jesse. Jesse begat David, as you read, I mean, verses, and Jesse begat David, the king, and David the king begat Solomon, of her that had, that had been the wife of Urias. As you read on, you then locate Jesus in that lineage. An alert woman. The transformative power of God brought her from that hopeless life to a life of the king of kings. Her name became listed. I, 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 I sense in my spirit that there is somebody here, God wants to give you this kind of encounter. It doesn't matter what your yesterday have been like. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what the story men have written or are turning around about you. But you have, you have Christ in the house today. You have the power of transformation in the house today to transform you. In fact, strongly I feel that for the reason of what men look at you and call you, you have even dipped your hand into something that you are not supposed to because of what men see you and refer to you as. But there is the power of transformation in the house today. If only you will run to Jesus. He is able to change your life. And peradventure, you have, you have surrendered your life before now to Jesus. But you have gone or you have looked the other way. You are like the prodigal son. You are now eating with the pigs. God is able to bring you back and is interested in bringing you back. He wants to give you, again, the salvation experience. Don't resist him. He said, I stand at the door of your heart knocking. He said, if anyone here has been, let him open up and I come in. I said, when I come in, I will do what? I will dine with him. Can you allow Jesus to dine with you today as we bow our heads in the place of prayer. Can you talk to God this morning? Talk to him, talk to him, talk to him, talk to him. Um, just speak. Open up your heart to Jesus this morning and ask for that encounter again. That encounter, that power. That power that is able to bring you to the point of deliverance, the point of salvation. The point of setting free. Can you ask him to come in? He said, mortify therefore. Mortify. Mortify. Verse 5 of that particular Colossians 3. Mortify. Deal with it. The members. He said, mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. Deal with every act of fornication. 
Deal with every act of uncleanness. Deal with inordinate affection. Deal with them. Deal with covetousness. Deal with idolatry. Deal with them in the place of prayer. And say, Lord, let your transformative power work upon me. And take out all of these and put them off. And if you are that person or other people, you want to come to Christ, you want to encounter that transformative power just by a show of hand, let us pray with you this morning. You want to surrender your life to Jesus? Or you want to rededicate your life? Can you lift up your hand as we pray this morning? Anyone in the house? Anyone in the house, if you are lifting it up, lift it up. Don't, don't be ashamed of anything. We all came to that point at some point in time. Can you lift up your hand if you are lifting up? Um, let, let the heavens see your hand. Pray for yourself. Yes, God bless you. Pray for yourself. Yes, God bless you. Lift it up. Let the heavens see it. Let the heaven, There's nothing to be ashamed of. God can change your yesterday. He can transform your yesterday the same way he transformed the life of Rahab the adult. Who had no lineage whatsoever. He, he did not, she did not amount to anything. But he began a, she began a walk. And that walk brought her to the lineage of Jesus. Oh, God is able to. God is able to. And this next call is not for salvation. You want to experience the transformative power of God. Rise to our feet. The chaplain is going to pray for us. We want a change. A definite change. We want that to happen to us. You are born again, but you are asking that the power that transforms life come upon you now and bring about a change in every circumstance of your life. Rise to your feet as we pray. Rise to your feet as we pray. Oh, Daddy, we thank you. Jehovah God, we bless you. Spirit of the living God, you are the transforming power of God. Upon everyone who is standing, rest upon them this day. Turn around their fears and break every yoke in the name of Jesus. I'm asking that you be empowered to live this life in the name of Jesus Christ. Our Father, we thank you for the word that has come our way this morning. We we'll receive it with thanksgiving in the name of Jesus. And we are asking the Lord upon your servant, your hand will rest upon him. This war will not stand against him in eternity. But Lord, you empower him to be a benefactor and a beneficiary of this in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you for what you have done for us as an assembly. We we'll receive your word with thanksgiving. And our lives will never remain the same again. In Jesus' name we have prayed.